it's Tom Chop, uh, Wetlands Program Manager at Earthwatch Australia, and it is a climate adaptation themed, but it's also an education themed kind of session, so I put a few things both there. So um, I work at Earthwatch, which is a not-profit citizen science research organisation all about empowering people to save the natural world. And in my role there, I run a program called Mangrove Watch, which is all about getting people like yourself excited about mangroves and educated, engaged and empowered to better protect these habitats. Why? Because mangroves are amazing. So mangroves are valuable. If you didn't know that, if you've eaten a fish or a crab or a prawn lately, then there's a little bit of mangrove in you. Uh, and so whether you know it or not, we're all connected to mangroves. If you live on the coast, they're protecting you, your house. They're cleaning our waters, protecting the Great Barrier Reef from sediments and nutrients. They um, provide a nice little place for birds and bees and insects and all lots, lots of other critters. They store lots of carbon and of course they have a, um, a lot of significance to people such as the Gubba Gubba traditional owners of, of this country. And I'd like to acknowledge those traditional owners and their long-standing connection to mangroves, which they continue to this day. And hopefully we can instill some of that um, connection in the broader community to protect these habitats because, um, and so th this, this value is finally being recognized. Uh, there's lots of investment happening in mangroves, including right here on the Sunshine Coast with the, the Blue Heart Program. And that's all about blue carbon. So looking at the role that mangroves play in storing carbon, they store four to 10 times more carbon than any other habitat per hectare and they trap it 50 times faster up to. Um, so they also, uh, part of the coastal, coastal hazard adaptation strategies along much of Queensland's coastline because they can break the energy of storm surges and cyclones. So they lift the cyclonic winds up over the mangroves and dump it into the people who built on the hills behind. So it's nice to know. Um, but uh, yeah, so they're very important as a climate adaptation solution, a nature-based solution to the, the challenges that we face with climate change. Uh, but they are also vulnerable to climate change. So I travel around Australia a lot and unfortunately uh, from climate impacts, be it sea level rise, changing rainfall patterns, so that's a big El Nino event in 2015 that caused the largest dieback of mangroves in the world, uh, recorded to this date in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Severe floods and even bushfires, which is why mangroves don't burn, but that's how severe the bushfires were in southern New South Wales. So these are the things that mangroves are facing, the challenges. Not only that, despite the fact that it's very clear that these habitats are important, we know they're valuable and we know that they're vulnerable. The science is clear on that as well. We're not very good at managing them. We've got, uh, we've got laws that protect them as well. So all mangroves are protected under the Fisheries Act. Uh, but again, every place I go, there's things that people are doing that are impacting this habitat, either directly or indirectly. And those impacts are impacting the capacity of those habitats to adjust to climate change. So they're impacting the resilience. And they're also threatening the ecosystem service values upon which we all rely. So it is in my view that we, the science is clear, that mangroves are important and they're, they're valuable and vulnerable. We've got laws that protect them, um, but we're still losing mangrove habitat. And, and there is investment in, um, in restoring mangrove habitat. There isn't that same investment in protecting the existing mangrove from the, those human pressures. So I think that the, the secret source, the, the missing piece is us, the community. Um, and I, I firmly believe that to, to save and protect mangroves and all the wonderful things they provide for us, we need an informed and engaged community to identify local threats so we can implement management actions. And those who saw Shannon's talk earlier see how that plays out in the um, local action plan process. So, but the, what, what is missing in all of this in terms of investing in um, climate adaptation strategies using mangroves and threat mitigation is the youth voice. So there are currently very little, very few pathways to enable the youth voice to have a say in what's being decided in terms of nature-based solutions and protection of habitat that will impact their future. And I know for a fact, having worked with lots of student groups and spend weeks in the mangroves with them, that they are very capable and very intelligent and have the, the wherewithal to, to feed into this process and they should have a say in what we're doing for their future. Um, and the great thing about students and youth is that they're at school, a lot of them, 
So they're out there collecting environmental data as part of their school programs if they're doing biology or science, and we can harness that, harness that uh, people power for good. It's obviously what citizen science is all about. So uh, through our Mangrove Watch program, we have developed five citizen science methods that uh, are applicable and adaptable to youth-based education programs that range from biodiversity assessment, so observational data collection using iNaturalist. You can find Mangrove Watch um, iNaturalist projects on iNaturalist, uh, all the way through to assessing how much carbon is stored in your local mangrove habitat. And so we developed some lesson plans with Cool Australia. We work with them. For those of you who know, they have online education resources. We've made some training videos about how this um, can be implemented in schools. And then we got some funding from the Great Barrier Reef Foundation to run some workshops to educate teachers. And uh, that was great. Uh, we had a lot of data collected. We had data going to the National Greenhouse Accounts to inform our blue carbon policy. And it was all wonderful. So that was in 2020, 2021. But then we actually drilled down into it. The data that was actually generated from that process was coming from a few number of places and a few number of people. Um, so it was good data, but few people. Uh, and the long-term engagement really dropped off quite rapidly. So to, to date, based on that program, there's only one place where data is still being continued as a result of those two-day workshops that we ran with with teachers. So we learned some things in that process is that uh, obviously we've heard yesterday through the education platform, there's time, money, how the program aligns with curricula. I mean, Queensland, it changes. It seems quite regularly. <laughs> um, teacher confidence is a big thing. We weren't very good at communicating with our teachers. We said, here's some information, catch you later. Uh, and teacher movement, so not mentioning any names, but those who went to Antarctica. Uh, and um, competing interests as well. Obviously, there's other environmental programs that they can engage with. The last two we can't do much about, but we can do something about all the others. So we re took a good hard look at ourselves and reinvigorated the program for this year. And we focused on that confidence, time, money, curriculum alignment, and communication. And we ran two day, two six day immersive experiential programs in the audience have been on one of these and had a, to establish a deep connection with the habitat. Um, we had a, an award-winning teacher on staff to help develop the program and um, we co-collaborated to design individual teacher-based uh, projects that they could deliver within their context. And um, we also provided some money to help them deliver those projects thanks to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation again. And we have ongoing communication via WhatsApp uh, channels. And I've been into various places, traveling around and connected directly with them. And there was also direct connection with students through the Teach Live program. So that helps to foster a relationship with us as scientists. And we've partnered local community groups with schools in some locations as well. And that seems to be working. So great outcomes. Uh, everyone who came along loved it. That's just some good, good metrics there. Uh, but we've already had data collection going on. There's some great projects. Um, ooh, I think I'm going to interrupt. But anyway, you can see there's lots of, uh, lots of people involved and lots of, we've now got greater coverage across the coast with lots of different players from ecotourism organisations that like the Lark, marine-based aquamobile, taking students out to schools. Um, Pioneer Landcare is partnering with the high schools in Mackay to work on a mangrove citizen science program there. Each of one of these is a bespoke program that can be delivered uh, independently. And um, so we've got yeah, sort of this lifetime journey. We've got preschoolers through to senior high schoolers and uh, the adults. And there's been lots of biodiversity discovery along the way. So just these crabs that I've put up there are new crab findings or rediscoveries from long time ago in each of those locations. So there's lots of benefits. Uh, and so I think with that better engagement, we've been able to get better outcomes. Um, but I'd like to just quickly wrap up by enrolling you in my vision for the future, because which is about activating those youth voices 
in that climate adaptation management decision making. So I want you to imagine that you're in a, in a workshop with a, surrounded by your peers and stake, other community stakeholders and who have an interest in the estuary space. They, uh, you've just heard a presentation from someone like me about the data that's being collected and what the health of the mangroves are and the issues and that sort of thing that the data, citizen science data has been telling us. A student group who have been involved in the data collection process directly gets up and presents their vision for the future for what they would like their estuary to look like in the next 20 to 30 years and presents through the running a workshop with you that what some of the solutions that they think should be implemented to achieve that process. Then you, as the decision makers in the room, come together and then come up with three to five local actions that are estuary specific that can be delivered at that local scale to help those students achieve their vision for the future. And that, I think, is what real empowerment and community empowerment is about through citizen science. And I think that is the power of citizen science, but also it's a pathway for activating these youth voices. So thank you. And uh, if you'd like your mangroves watched, come and see me. Okay. Um, thanks, Jock. Any questions? We've got quite good questions here for Jock in the audience. Comments? Here we go. Jess? Hi, Jock. Another great talk. Thank you. Um, I am very interested in any major difficulties you might have had to learn from relating to working with educators and students because we really learn a lot from reflecting maybe on failures and things like that. Yeah, so like I said that we learned that, um, you know, just why it um, should have been obvious, but basically what we saw in the education talks, but providing information and providing an initial engagement and then walking away is not a, not a good approach. Um, so having that deeper connection and long-term connection is, is good, but also having the ability to adapt a methodology. So we're getting the data that we need to a different context. So obviously we're working with Cooktown State High. Um, they haven't implemented their action plan yet, but they have a mostly indigenous community who um, need a different type of program, a more accessible language in the information that they're receiving. And um, so it's working with those teachers who understand their student group so that we can deliver the information they need to get the students engaged and out there collecting data. And so in the Torres Strait, for instance, they looked at it and went, okay, well, our students don't like being in the classroom, but then what they really want to do is just go around and look at stuff in the mangroves and they know everything that's out there, so why not get them taking photos? And that crab that I showed that was there, one of those crabs, was a crab that walked through the school and the students because they were already aware of what they should be looking out for. We're like, hey, we found this crab wandering through the school. Can we put it on our natural list? And the teacher took a photo of it and it was a crab that hadn't been seen on Thursday Island since 1929 and something. So it's just those kind of things that you're engaging those students in, in a way that is applicable to them and their context. And now next year they're going fishing for crabs um, as part of their aquatic practices program. Um, I'll start you. I'll, I'll go for the last question. Hi, I'm great talk. Um, I'm from Adelaide and I'm not sure if you um, know much about the mangroves there but there's a place called St Kilda um, and there was a salt mining company and something happened with the salt, it got into the water and so there's, I'm not sure if this is the right stat but it, it says 10 hectares of mangroves died um, and I was just wondering if you've heard about that, if you have any like thoughts on how that can um, yeah, be helped. So I, yeah, I had a little interview on local ABC Adelaide there about that when that first happened, but um, there are local people who are looking into it and there's community citizen science action that's taking place with a person called Perry Coleman um, who's, who's doing work on that and there's also been scientific investigations done by the South Australian government that have done a very in-depth assessment of what's going on there. So it's, uh, there's, there's local action happening there that's not it's indirectly related to Mangrove Watch, but um, yeah, so it's in, it's in good hands, just to put it that way. Yeah, just a quick question. The, you showed that it was Holloway's Beach uh, was the one that continued with the work. Is that because they'd already been doing, taking 
doing stuff with kids in the mangroves before compared to the other centres you worked with that perhaps didn't work on mangroves? It's, it's, there's no one factor, I guess. It's a combination of there's a, a person there who was passionate. Um, they brought mangroves right there uh, to engage the students with. And um, there's also a teacher who is, is passionate and is able to go on with that program. But that said, they, they have integrated our mangrove watch methodology into their standard programming. So there's lots of, lots of the data that we're collecting. It's still ongoing. Yeah, so student groups collecting different habitat, habitat stuff. So, and they've also helped with the report card data collection as well, which Shane talked about earlier. So in a way, that they had location, location. The others have to take the kids from some distance. No, it's not always. Way. There's places where it's very easy to access the mangroves. It's just, um, it's about people. It's always about the people. So it's about connecting with the right people in the right place at the right time and fostering what might be a bubbling away underneath a passion for helping the mangroves and tapping into that and making it bloom into full-scale citizen science action for them. <laughs> well, well, thanks very much for that, Jock. Um, I read somewhere that they are the kidneys of the planet. That's one expression that's been used for mangroves, the kidneys. They, cleans, they clean the water, yeah. <laughs> Good on you, Jock, thank you.